work. So my name is Megan Donahue, and I am a senior design PM in the Windows Phone design team. Uh, and I was trying to think about sort of what types of topics I wanted to get at today when I was talking to you guys. And you know, some of the feedback that we've been hearing from the field around when they're trying to build um, applications is that they find the Metro design language to be really constraining. And they don't understand how they can use it in a manner that will enable them to build experiences that are differentiated and unique. And you know, I was thinking about this a lot. And it really kind of clicked for me when I actually was on the plane and I got off here in Vegas. And I was riding along in the taxi. And I, you know, we get to the strip, and you look down the street, and there's this hotel after hotel after hotel. And they're all super unique and super creative and have really amazing user experiences. But when you break it down, I mean, a hotel is, consists of a few fundamental things. You need a room, hopefully some windows in there, a bed, a bathroom, and some lights. So if I was a hotel designer and I took that to heart as those are the rules that I have to abide by in creating my hotel, you know, I think the Vegas Strip would look a lot different and we'd all be staying in Motel 6s this week and it would not be nearly as fun. But thankfully, the designers for the hotels thought through that end-to-end -end experience and really took to heart what's the first thing you see when you walk in the door? How does the lobby look? How does it make the user feel when they come in and experience that hotel? And then the details around the amenities in the room, you know, what types of beds you have, and then even beyond that, to retain them and keep them coming back again and again, building strong uh, restaurants and really amazing entertainment experiences. And that's really kind of what I want to, you know, you to leave today with thinking about is how Metro should be viewed as kind of an infrastructure for you to build on and innovate on, and you can make it uniquely yours. Um, and so, let's see here. How we're going to do that today, I'm going to go through briefly um, some, some basics just to sort of get people on the same page about concepts I think are important in the Metro language. Then we'll go into um, some process-related stuff. Um, as a design PM, I care a lot about process. It's something I work on quite a bit with my designers and trying to think about how you know, we can have a design process that integrates really seamlessly with our engineering process. Um, then I'll hopefully show you some... Uh, inspirational uh, ideas for how you can take the Metro language and, and do innovative work with it. And we'll apply it to a concept that uh, my designer and I worked on. So let's get started. So basics, um, we'll go through the Metro principles really quick. I won't touch on this a whole lot because I think most people in the room, I assume, are familiar with them. Um, but I'll point you to some resources if you want to find out more later on. Um, we'll talk about the overall hierarchy of the Windows Phone application, or Windows Phone um, OS, just so you can sort of understand how that fits into your application designs itself. We'll dig into the page structure and things to think about when doing that, and then we'll talk about controls. Um, so Metro, what is Metro? Metro is uh, a code name that we came up with when we went out um, to decide upon how we wanted to frame the Windows um, Phone OS. And we had looked at a lot of inspiration in uh, transportation graphics in particular. And something that was really exciting to us was this idea of having extremely clean, crisp, understandable um, designs and signage that enabled a variety of users who come from all sorts of cultural backgrounds and language backgrounds to be able to accomplish the same tasks and do it quickly and efficiently. You know, we're all in the train station trying to get on that train in time. You don't want to miss it. So these signs are designed explicitly for that, and they use big typography and, and white space in order to enable people to see and understand information and go where they need to go. The metro principles that came out of a lot of these explorations, the ones listed here, clean, light, open, fast, celebrate typography, alive and in motion, content not chrome, and authentically digital. Sorry, my voice is really dry today. Um, we'll touch on some of the first ones later on in the deck, but the last one I really wanted to dig in here um, is the notion of authentically digital and what does that mean. And I break it down into sort of two different chunks. The first chunk is this idea that we should move away from past constraints and restraints we may have had when designing UI um, systems in the past. So you know, a lot of choices that UI designers five, 10 years ago had to work around were um, limitations that they had with their hardware and their technology. So screen resolutions were not nearly as good. Text technology was nowhere where it is today. Uh, processing speed also very, very um, small compared to today. And so they had to make choices when de designing the UI to build a performant and easy to use system. And a lot of those restraints that they operated under no longer apply in today's world. We have technology available where you know, we can almost do anything we want. Our processors are super fast. The displays are beautiful. You know, the text technology is extremely powerful. And so why do we need to keep a lot of those old UI metaphors in place in today's UI language? The second part of this authentically digital concept that I find really exciting is this notion of content being the pixel. And what they, I mean by that was um, 
this notion of shifting from what was previously a very iconographic approach to the UI design, where we used the real world metaphors and built those into, the, into our digital objects. Um, and we tried to um, make this sort of hyper-realistic effect. And the content was being translated from its analog state into this digital state, and our UI operating systems had to provide the tools to manipulate that content. So with the Metro and the Windows Phone OS, we wanted to shift that and make it an inspiration based upon the objects themselves, the people, the music, the photos, the places that we like to visit, and build that into the system and as an inherent part of the UI. And that shifted us into a more infographic approach to design. And by this, we could actually take content and represent it truly and wholly on the device, and then layer over on top of that um, information in a seamless way. And the user can interact directly with the content, and the UI is just assumed. You don't have to explain it to the user. And these inspirations came from a variety of areas. We looked at you know, some lesser known Windows products or Microsoft products such as the, um, the Zoom client or Windows Media Center. We also looked into science fiction movies, you know, Avatar and Minority Report where you have characters just interacting with the content directly in space and it's just there and it exists as part of you. And so it really made this interesting shift where suddenly our devices were no longer representations of digital objects but now they could become a representation of our digital self. Um, so beyond sort of what Metro looks like, like Metro's got a very unique look, but it also has a feel to it that is inherent underneath that look, and that's something that's probably not talked about as explicitly in a lot of our documentation. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to spend a moment talking about kind of how the system's set up here. Um, it's a hub and spoke model is sort of the background for how you navigate around the Windows Phone OS. You start with start, it's sort of the home base where a user knows and feels comfortable and personalizes it as their own thing. And then they can move forward along what we kind of use this analogy of a train um, station, much like a metro station, where you can hop on a train and you can move from place to place to place along this very connected path. And it makes sense. It's very literal. And if you choose to turn around and go back to where you came from, you literally turn around and you navigate your way back through the system. And this is very clean, it's very understandable, and it's based in really physical, real-world um, mental models for our user. It requires a lot of trust, however. Oops. Um, upon us as the designers for our, our Windows Phone OS and for you as designers of the applications that you have to trust the hardware. We've actually given you a lot of power here because no longer do you need to build in all the UI elements to make the user navigate through your application. We've taken it out and made it this universal navigation that you can put in the hardware so that your application is free from that and that space can be devoted to content and it can be devoted to all the rich experiences you want to provide. And the users understand this model and they get it. We spent a lot of time in our usability labs testing how users understand and work with start and they work with the back button and it's, get, it's easy for them. They understand it. They, you know, they realize if they want to start an experience from fresh, they hit start and they can you know, launch to the top of these applications and they have choices there about whether to start something new or whether to resume what they were doing before. But if they ended up navigating on accident into a scene they didn't intend to visit, they can quickly escape that by hitting the back button and travel back along that path, and it just makes sense to them. Um, but there are pitfalls that can happen if we don't think thoughtfully around building the hierarchy of applications, both in the first party experience as well as in, in your application. Um, and so those in particular, there's sort of two of them that I like to coin. Um, one is this idea of um, the recursive loops where if you start to, if you, if you build an application and are not trusting the hardware and you provide software um, hooks to help them navigate through your application, you can get into this sticky place because the hardware is still there and it's still going to function. So if a user uses a software button that takes them back to the top of an application and then uses the back button to travel around, it's very easy to get caught in these recursive loops and they don't know how to escape anymore. They panic and what do they do? They hit start and exit. And so you want to avoid giving them that sort of panic moment where they're not sure how to move around the application. And the other um, sort of trap to keep an eye out for is this idea of phantom back navigation models where um, we were seeing this acutely with first party experiences, um, particularly when we introduced the idea of being able to pin secondary tiles to your start screen. So for example, if I pinned a contact, my husband, onto the start screen so I could easily get into his card because I talked to him a lot on the phone, um, the, the, design, the team that wanted to build the people experience were expecting that the back button out of there would take you to the top of the people experience, not to start where I had originated from. And this caused a lot of um, confusion as users were using it because 
if you, again, apply this to that metaphor of the train station. So imagine you get on the train and you travel three or four stops along this path and then you realize, oh no, I left my purse. It's sitting on a bench back at that train station. So I'm going to get on the re returning train, travel through those same screens that I just visited, and then I open the doors and I'm not at the station that I had gotten on. Suddenly you're in this other world and you're like, I don't know what happened here. I just got off in this sort of phantom land and I'm very confused. And in our model for the Windows Phone OS, people panic and they hit the start button and they start over. So these are just things to keep in mind. You can fall into these pitfalls too just by um, not sort of following a lot of the interaction guidelines that we've provided um, out there. So I'd be happy to answer questions about this at the end if people have them, but I don't want to ruminate on it too much. Um, but the net of all of this is this notion of predictability. Because we've given you hardware buttons, we all have to play nice with one another. If I have an application that I'm writing and I choose to do something different that doesn't play nice with the system, then um, it's going to be only hurting our user at the end of the day because they'll get used to and trained to interact with the operating system and with all the applications on it in a very predictable manner. But then when they enter into the application I wrote where I chose to do something different, they will get confused and start to mistrust the system as a whole. So not only do you not do yourself any justice, you're not doing your friends sitting next to you any justice either. So try and make sure that the experiences you're building, particularly around the hierarchies of your applications, feels predictable and, and layers on top of the this hub and spoke model. That said, the hub and spoke model is not the only thing that you can do in the Windows Phone OS, and I think this is where some of the power really lies. This notion of integrated experiences. And you'll see it extremely acutely in our first party experiences today, and this is something we're going to keep working with our app plaid development team on building more and more hooks for third party developers to help integrate into the first party experiences and to win each other's experiences over time. But how does this work in this sort of hub and spoke world? You can still travel through, you know, from start into your applications in this model, but then traverse to a connecting place that takes you to another app. This is extremely delightful for a user. So you can imagine instead of having to always exit one app and go to the other one to accomplish a task, you can just tap on an element that takes you into a new application and move through in this really logical manner that lets you get to what you're trying to do. So I've got my husband's contact card pinned to start. I enter it and I tap text message my husband and it takes me into the SMS experience. He has sent me a photograph. I can launch that into the photos experience and all of these start to connect to each other in this really powerful and exciting way. And this is where the, the navigation model um, really ties into the, the hardware and the buttons in particular is this notion of the connected places. So you can still give the user a really understandable manner to move around the system because of this literal back model. And it gives them a really um, logical way to say, like, I, you know, I got on this train, which is sending a text message and viewing pictures of my husband um, that he sent to me, and I travel through all of these different stations, and now I can return through that same set of connected paths without having to exit each app and relaunch them again. So it's really, it's really fun. And the thing that's cool is that we've already given some hooks for you guys to do this now in the, in the third party experiences, and we'll keep growing this over time. So in particular, in the music um, land, we've got a lot of apps that integrate directly with our music and videos hub. Um, they show um, content that you listen to in, in the, the media controls. And then likewise, you can launch these experiences and actually see your own content tied in. Um, there's some lyrics applications and other concert-based applications that do this really great, where it's a moment of delight. You launch this application you've downloaded from the, the marketplace, and suddenly all of your content that's already on the phone is lit up into the application, and it knows which songs to get my lyrics for, and it's really fun for the user, and it gives them a lot of power and delight with that. So um, yeah, we'll move on. So then after you've sort of thought through <coughs> Excuse me. The page structure, or sorry, the inf the information hierarchy for your application as a whole. You want to dig into the details at a page by page level, um, and this is. It can be a hard exercise to do, and this is where sort of that first touch of the metro fierce reduction really comes into play here, is how do you think about the tasks on the page and what the users are supposed to be doing frequently versus less frequently, and prioritizing it in a manner that makes sense to them, and giving the correct visual weight and power to the things they'll do a lot, and giving um, them the ability to find the rest of the stuff, but not in a way that gets in their way. And so you can utilize uh, controls that we provide, such as the application bar, to do this, where you can have the tasks you're going to do more frequently visible right there on the application bar. And you can hide some of the other ones that they'll need to get from time to time, but not every, every time they play with it, down in the application menu. 
You can also use controls like our context menu to accomplish some of these tasks where if you want to give them sort of a delightful power user moment, um, if there's a, a task, for example, in um, a calendar here, I'll, I'll talk about like the replying to the person who set up this meeting. If I wanted to um, move that one level up, you could utilize a context menu at the entry point where you know, if I drill into that ac calendar appointment page, I can reply, but I maybe might want to also have that available as a context menu item hidden at the next level up for a discoverability moment where a power user can find it and um, be more efficient with their tasks. You have to be a little cautious with context menus because they are for sort of that secondary use in terms of they shouldn't be the only way to accomplish the task. They're not the most discoverable, so you can't assume a user will always find the context menus. So thinking through exactly like when is it appropriate to use a control um, of one type versus another is really important with Metro. And then last on this is this notion of orientation. Because we offer experiences like the pivots and the panoramas where you can move through lots of different scenes and filters of data, um, it's easy to, to make some sort of arbitrary organization of the data that might not be immediately obvious to the user, and if they pivot through two or three screens, suddenly they're kind of lost and they don't understand where they are or what they're looking at. So we give a general guideline to our teams that, you know, for the pivots, you don't want to go beyond, you know, seven different panes in the pivot, and for the panoramas, reducing it down even more to no more than five because of this sense of disorientation. The users can get lost if you're not careful, if you don't have a logical way to present stuff, and if you do it too much at the top, it can get really confusing for them. Um, yeah, so let's move on. So once you have a notion of the information architecture for your page, then you'll want to start thinking about that visual design and what, um, what you want to do first, or what I recommend that you do first, is think through you know, a strict apl application of Metro. You know, get the, the layout correct and clean and make sure that the typography is really strong and then think about the ways you can layer on brand on top of that. Um, we'll go through some examples later on where I show you how to do this. But um, when you work with Metro, uh, really think about the grid system and how do you align elements on the page so that they're consistently aligned and they give a sense of really clean, strong boundaries. Um, embrace the white space and reduce clutter. It's, you know, it's really enticing to fill the whole screen with as much stuff as possible because the screens are they're big and they're beautiful and they show a lot of stuff. But think about it again from that point of view of the user. When you come to a screen, if there's so much going on and their eye doesn't know where to look on the page, they're going to find that confusing and unusable and they'll probably not want to use that application anymore. So um, embrace the white space and use the balance of your typography to help you with that. So give stronger weight and bigger sizes to the things that are important and utilize the accent color to kind of highlight information that might be more dynamic or changing. Um, let me take it. There's a lot of examples available on the phone today in the first party experiences and I urge you to look at them and use them as a guide for this sort of thing. And then there's some templates and stuff I think out on the web that will try to help keep improving over time to give you an idea of the right way to apply the visual layouts. But also, um, you know, we will want to innovate on this too, and we'll go into this in a, in a little bit. Oh, as you mentioned, designing for touch. It's, um, because we're working in a touch screen system, it's uh, an, a misnomer that the touch target regions for each of the elements on the page exactly match the size of the item on the page. And you have to think about the fact that people's fingers are pretty fat you know, whether you like it or not, we all have more or less the same size fingers. And so if you want to have a tappable element on the page that is small in nature, give it space around it to provide a larger tap region that may not have an actual visual, visual boundary to it, but still activates as a touch element. And so you'll see this in, we'll do tricks like this throughout the first party system where, um, you know, even with our application buttons, they're only around 60, I think they're 68 pixels square, but the touch region itself is 72 pixels square around it, and that means that there's more ability for the user to touch, it becomes a much more responsive and usable system. Um, I'm not gonna go into much more on controls, because I think there's a lot of stuff out on the web for you right now, and we'll be here, you know, this week, myself and the, some of my designers are around if you have questions on, um, on the control system, but there are blogs online as well you can check out, and I'll make sure to post up there after this talk um, some of the videos from last year, because I know that the team talked much more deeply about controls, and there's also some other information I'll share with you guys, so feel free to check that out, and uh, we'll move forward. So. A little break here. Sorry. So moving on. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a design PM in the team, and 
um, I try to, at, one of my roles is to help facilitate a design process in the studio that not only our designers follow, but also that our engineering teams can work with us on and, and follow. And so let's go through what I mean by that. Um, and this is notion of think, going from think to make. So it's this sort of interplay between the right brain and the left brain. I actually spent a lot of time um, in graduate school in a group called the Aesthetics and Computation Group that was really looking at this exact problem where you want to be able to balance visual, artistic design and really creative spaces with the more rigid um, engineering practices. And using the digital world as a tool and a medium to help enable really beautiful and amazing experiences for people. Um, and Metro is something that can't be engineered, so by nature you need to help infuse a design thinking and design process into how you build and design your applications in order to get it right. It's not something you can write a test system for, it's not something you can write strict code for, it's something you have to learn and understand and embrace and help um, question and challenge it and help it grow as well. Um, so we actually use a design process um, to help with our planning phases um, in the Windows Phone team. And this is really exciting because it can help make sure that we reduce a lot of um, last minute hacks and uh, otherwise maybe less savory choices in the system by having a good planning process up front. And an example that an app plat team um, member of mine came and talked to me about was some feedback he'd received from developers where you know, they would build a really nice app and they'd be ready to ship it out the door. And then at the last minute, their legal team would come and say, oh, wait, you have to give them a chance to accept to these terms and services before they use your app. And if they don't accept, then they can't use the app. And so the engineers would just hack in, you know, a dialogue box that would basically say yes or no. And if they clicked no, they'd quit the app and everything would be done. Well, that's not a really good experience for a user. If you come into an application and the first thing you're shown is a dialog box and you don't understand what it means and what you're supposed to do with it, you may get scared and click no. And then the application quits out and you haven't helped the user learn anything more about what the application does or why it's really powerful. So if, you had, if we spend the time thinking about these types of edge cases and these weird scenarios up front, then you can think through a more thoughtful way to engage that user in that moment when they need to make a choice. So give them you know, the information right up front if they choose not to accept it, you can give them um, some, a, a static landing page where they can sit and think about what they did, maybe offer them a chance to launch it again. Maybe you provide them more information for why they really should use your app because it's super awesome and you want them to keep using it. And that way, they're not just exited out and, lost, and left to never launch it again. And so all of these things are, are examples that can sort of are reasons why we want to have a design-based process here. It can also um, illuminate a lot of opportunities for innovation and maybe ideas for future applications that you might want to build. And it's really, it can be fun for the whole team to engage in. So how do you do it? First and foremost, understand the timeline that you're operating in. You can apply a good design process to a two-week or a two-day project and to a three-year project as long as you're realistic around the amount of time you have to spend in each of the different phases. So set that timeline and have an agreement with your team on what your milestones are for each of them. Um, once you've done that, we've, I've actually shown this, this slide with a couple different iterations of this graph where we've had lots of big bubbles, of five or six of them in a row, but every time I look at it, it actually susses down to about two major phases for me. The first is this kind of going big phase where you're gonna try to define and explore and come up with lots of ideas. And this is that point in time where the designers get a bad rap. We sit around in our black turtlenecks and we drink our lattes and we smoke cigarettes and we draw pretty pictures and our life is really fun and it's exciting but we don't ever ship a product because we're just designers and we're talking very high level all the time. This is that point in our project where we'll do that but that's not all that the designers should be doing. Um, so early on, you want to establish some clear principles. This is uh, very powerful for helping to have the right conversations with the people who are building the application. So any of your engineers in particular is getting everybody on board with what you want to build. You might go about building it 15 different ways, but at least there's a common understanding of this is our goal for what we want to build. And you establish some clear principles up front, write them down, have them available to the team, and you can refer back to them over and over again to make sure that you're still aligned with that original vision. Then you can spend this time doing the brainstorming, going big, thinking of a lot of ideas, but eventually you want to start to narrow it down to a few specific concepts that you want to dive into more deeply. And this is where designers can help you come up with the storyboards and illustrate the ideas on paper. Um, they can do it through 
literal cartoonish storyboards. They might break it down into a page hierarchy and infrastructure for the app. You know, but coming up with some really crisp notions that you can get in front of people, that you can play around with, that you can talk about as a group and understand together how you move from page to page in the app and what exactly it's doing. And the nice thing about doing this on paper and not forcing you to do it in code is it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot easier to make changes. And you can still suss out many of the interaction issues you might find later on in a much quicker and more flexible manner. So after you've spent all this time kind of going big and coming up with a lot of ideas and then working with the team to narrow it down to something you want to build, um, you'll sort of switch into this next phase of the design process, which is the refining, the committing, and the realization phase. This also coincides um, in the Windows team with how, Windows Phone team with how um, our engineering teams work. This is really the point in the project where the engineers start to write code. We don't have to have the final visual spec done for our designs and for our applications at this point in time as long as there's an agreement on what the pages are, how they fit together in that hierarchy, and how they're going to present information on the page in a very rough form. That's enough information for developers to start getting all of the hooks in place and building the infrastructure for the experience. And then the designers can spend time working to refine the layout, working to apply that metro look, bringing in the brand, and understanding where motion will tie into all of this. So that's sort of in that refinement phase where the two teams are going to start making it real but working together and simultaneously trying to um, get it into real code. As you get through towards the bottom end of the ramp is this commitment in the realization phase where you need to be actually testing on device and what I, rec oh, sorry. what I recommend is actually devoting a team of engineers who are focused solely on the UI layer and really understanding what the designer's intentions are so they can help make it come to life in code. Um, it's easy at the end of projects to get caught up in all of the big crashing bugs and the more scary functional issues and sort of forget, oh, this is some pixel pushing over here. It's not very important. It's just a few you know, margins we didn't adjust. But the problem is if you let too much of that slide, the collective set of all those visual issues can add up to a really poor quality and uh, low fidelity experience. And the users that see that and they don't know how to articulate it, but they just feel it. They can tell the difference between an application that has a really high quality final look and feel and polish versus one that doesn't. And so um, we'll actually devote a whole separate team of, of engineers and a triage body with different guidelines for keeping that same level of, of bug fixing happening at the UI layer all the way to the end while still accomplishing fixing a lot of the functional issues. And that way we can polish both things without sacrificing one for the other. Um, so that's sort of in a nutshell a design process that we employ in the Windows Phone team. And um, you know, I'd be happy to talk about this more offline too. But I'd like to move on now to talk about you know, not just the process that we follow, but the, the stuff we try to suss out and what we're building. And this is really around creating a user journey for, the, for your application. What is the experience that you want to provide for the person who purchases and downloads your application? So first you need to know who you're going to build the application for. If you don't have a clear idea about who this is going to be, then you may not find yourself building an application that has a common, um, a clear sense of, 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 of goal and need at the end. Um, we've done this on the Windows team. We have a usability team who's come up with a lot of personas, Anna and Miles. I think they were talked about in Mix last year. And so when you uh, check out the videos from last year, you can revisit who they are. I don't think everybody has the luxury of a usability team. So you can you know, find a muse, a friend, or a family member who you think embodies the spirit of the person you're building this application for, and try to keep them in mind when you're making choices about your, your design. What would they want? What would they need? Secondly, um, and this, by doing this, it provides a level of, of personality to the application that you might not otherwise have. And there's sort of three threads that we like to refer back to a lot in our design process around making things personal, relevant, and connected. What does it mean to make it personal? It's your phone, it's your people, it's your, it's your stuff, it's you, it's what you care about. And you want to make sure that you give them those things in this purest digital form. But you also want to make sure that it's relevant. I am not just a person, but I'm a person in time. I go out and I do things in the places. I have friends and family members that I do things with. And I want my phone to understand that and, and really have a sense of relevancy to my life. We could, for example, when we made the, um, the people list, sorry, we could have created this big, long 
flat list of phone numbers, and it would have accomplished that task of being a contacts list. But what we instead chose to do in, to make it more relevant is to serve up what they're doing and what they're, you know, is happening in their lives right now. And by doing that, it brings this level of delight that not only can I go and text my husband, but I also know whether or not he had posted on Facebook, if he had, you know, decided to go to the grocery store and found something really cool there. Maybe tomatoes are on sale, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's bringing that sense of relevancy to make it feel like it's more of, of who you are and not just serving data to the user. And then the nice thing um, about this and something that we strive to do as well is to make sure that we enable them to be in the present because of this. So, you know, we shouldn't um, build experiences that cause the users to just get sucked into the phone and miss what's happening in their life. We're not trying to change their life and replace it with the phone. We want the phone to augment it in the same way that we want information to overlay um, on the phone. We want the phone to overlay in their life. Um, so, you know, we spent about, what, 10,000, 10 billion years trying to stand up as a race, and it's, it's kind of humorous and something that we found funny in our team is that we actually over the last 10 to 15 years have slowly found ourselves sinking back down again because of the technology. So we've gotten more and more into this hunched up state, and we're hoping to help bring people back out of that again by giving them the way to get what they need when they want it and then let them get back to the stuff they're doing in the world. So you can see this kind of tongue in cheek in our, in our uh, marketing material, but this is really, I think, embodies that concept. So what else? As you create a user journey, some things to think about. What's that connectedness mean? What did I mean when I said that? So connectedness is around making sure that um, the information and the stuff that I care about is always available. So I've got people and data and feeds and all this stuff that we spent time building in the phone, and I want to be able to get it anywhere at any time. So thinking through that whole strategy around connecting this to other screens, you know, what happens with the experience on the on the on the PC, you know, or with other hardware platforms you might provide, and understand what's appropriate for each of them, so that you can provide unique experiences that are, you know, give purpose and reason to why you would want all three, but also help connect them together. Um, all of this is an attempt to try to create a lasting and meaningful experience for the user. And we really need to push that on you guys to make you understand how important it is to build a lasting and meaningful experience so that users come back and use your applications. You don't want to be building an application um, that's only used one time and then left to the wayside. And so some of the questions that I encourage you to ask yourself when you're coming up with your designs is, is it usable? Is it useful? And is it desirable? These are three really key things that we look for in the applications in the marketplace to, um, that will stand out when you see one that does it well. Um, you, know, you can have a very desirable concept, but if it's not useful or it's not usable, then the users are going to stop using it because the performance might be really bad or it might be really confusing to navigate around. So you want to kind of keep all of those things in mind when designing your applications. Um, the average application is actually used only 1%, or sorry, it's only used one time. And most of them are, you know, get, they get a couple runs and then it sort of teeters off with some data that's available on the web around applications um, on a bunch of platforms. And you can see that, you know, very quickly users will abandon an application if it doesn't do a good job of retaining them and giving them reasons to come back and use it again. Some of the uh, content types get this for free a little bit better, so you'll see some sports apps in particular, you know, they kind of cheat because you, you're going after a user base that already cares about the content inherently, and there's this built-in infrastructure for sporting events that happen over and over again that's going to entice the user to come back and check the scores, you know, not because the app itself is doing anything great, but just because that's the nature of sports. Um, a really great sports app, however, would help think about ways to bring them back in and get them engaged with the application in a way that's beyond just presentation of data that exists somewhere else. So building social networks around that sporting event, helping them learn about stuff that might be coming up, providing you know, up-to-the-date news or information about the, the athletes, um, and sort of layering on a much more rich experience for them. You can suss this out into sort of three big chunks. There's this attraction phase, a delight phase, and a retain phase. 
And I like to use an analogy of um, dating when I talk about what I mean with user journeys. So if you think about when you're trying to find sort of your lifetime mate, um, you are going to look around at a pool of people, and there's going to be certain things that will attract you to one over the other that makes you want to go have dinner with this person. And sometimes that can be purely aesthetic. It can be the visual look. How's that person look? It might be something you overheard them saying or something you know about them that is appealing to you. But regardless, you know, you go and you finally ask this person out on a date, and the two of you go out to dinner. And then you enter into this next phase where they have an opportunity to delight you. So as you get to know them more and more, they will start to tell really funny jokes and do things that you're like, wow, that's really, you know, really unique. This person's super cool. I can see myself dating them again and again. And another, um, but you could have the opposite experience at that first dinner where that, that person, instead of um, you know, delighting and teasing you, they actually just tell you their whole life story all at one time, including all of the negative baggage. And suddenly you're really freaked out and you're like, I don't want to ever see this person again. I'm going to run away and try and date somebody else. <laughs> and so that's that difference between trying to not give too much away during that first run experience, but help build a, and layer in depth to the application so that each time they go back, you get a new and fresh experience that you may not have had the first First time. And then the delight can really shine in that way. The retention part is sort of that long haul in the dating world where, you know, it's your lifetime, you're trying to find that lifetime mate. If the person you had gone on the, 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 the delightful dinner with kept telling the same jokes over and over, even after you'd finished dating them five or six months into the relationship and they still kept telling you that same joke, then suddenly what used to delight you will start to annoy you and you'll probably eventually break up with them because they really don't have much depth beyond that initial delight factor. But if they end up being somebody who has a lot of depth to them and tells new jokes and is trying out new activities and hobbies and keeps you excited, then that will retain you and you'll hopefully build a lasting relationship and be um, happy forever after. Your applications should do this. <laughs> so think about what that means to attract, delight, and retain your users. What is that first experience when they run it and download it um, and launch it? And then what are the delightful things you want to provide to them over time? So these, actually, send me back real quick. I have three um, applications I'm going to walk through really quick, just as examples that do um, some of this attraction, delight, and retention in a, a way that I find really exciting. Um, and there's other applications in the marketplace who have elements of this. It's a hard to find one that does all of these things really, really well, though. And that's something I'm going to push to you guys as a challenge as you think about kind of the next generation of applications you want to build, is how can you be that application that tells this whole story? So um, the Cocktail Flow app, I chose as my example of an attraction app because it has um, this really strong visual presence to it. They've embraced the metro concepts of white space and of typography, but they've made it uniquely theirs. And they've made it come to life in an extremely colorful and exciting way. And they've used motion and animation in a really exciting way. So you run the application, and your first experience is like, wow, this is more than just an ability to make drinks. It actually gives me, um, it, you know, it excites me because it's so beautiful. On the delight factor, there were, I actually toyed between two different ones to show because of, uh, for different reasons. This one I thought was really interesting in that it takes a really novel concept and brings it to life in an application and it actually helps you have um, some delightful experiences. So it helps you uh, find food trucks in the area of wherever you might be. So you launch the app and very quickly with one press of the button, it gives you this nice map with uh, a, overlaid with all the different food trucks in the area. But it even goes one step further, and it starts to, if you drill in, you can learn about what type of food it is, the history of the truck. It's got a lot of really rich data there, and it makes it seem really fun, and it adds that level of delight for, you know, particularly if you're traveling and you're trying to explore new spaces. Another app I was thinking of showing was one, I think it's called Local concerts where they really take the integration to heart with the Windows Phone operating system in that, you know, if I've got music on my device already and I've downloaded it and it's there and I launch this application, it knows that information and it doesn't just give me a new way to launch it and play the music, but it actually serves up concerts in the area of musicians and artists I care about. So not only do I find all the concerts in my region, but then you can pivot over to another pane, and suddenly it's got the concerts I really want to go see, and that's exciting. That's a very delightful moment for a user to just see it work. It's just magical, and it works. And then last, the retention one is really tricky. Um, here, I chose the Amazon app because they've, you know, they do a really strong um, work in the retention factor, not just on their Windows Phone app, but also on, you know, obviously on their website, where they think through recommendations and serve up really timely and um, applicable deals for the user to keep them coming back to see what they could um, get, you know, from day to day and time to time. 
And I actually find myself um, attracted to their Windows Phone app as, because I find it much more clean and simple to use than the website itself, where I usually tend to look over a lot of the recommendations when I'm browsing their website. But for some reason, when I jump into the Windows Phone app, they've presented it in such a, man a clean manner and a really fun manner where it suddenly feels like it's my application. So I typed in my username and I signed into Amazon and this went from being just the basic Amazon app to being my Amazon experience. And that's something that I know I'll use time and again because it's easy to find the stuff I care about quickly if I want to get directly into my orders, but I can also experience this really delightful and rich browsing experience. All right. so. This next little bit, I want to talk about um, kind of the look of Metro again, getting into sort of what makes Metro sing from a visual perspective. So we'll talk about um, some innovation ideas that you can um, try and do with your own applications. So first, you know, pivots and panoramas. What are pivots? What are panoramas? The pivots are the workhorse of the Windows Phone UI. They're there to be very efficient and task-based and provide easy ways to filter data and help the user find what they need. In contrast, the panorama intention is that it's this very exploratory, this um, immersive, expansive experience where it's not about doing work anymore. It's about giving the user a way to dive in and um, sort of swim through content in a really fun and delightful way. And then if they want to do additional work, you can prop them up with a strong set of pivot lists underneath and give them a more um, task-based space to do that. And the panoramas are very open, they're very um, free, and they're modeled after sort of these glossy magazine pages. So um, how to innovate on them? We really want to encourage, we have not seen these applications in the real world. These do not exist. These are concept designs that um, we put together in the team. But they're ideas of how you can push the envelope in the panoramas. You don't have to follow the exact rigid model of the panoramas and the first party experiences, but you can think about how to make an immersive experience for your own application's needs. So some examples here, there's a bank on the left where you actually have um, the user's financial journey over time and it gives them sort of a nice graphical way to view how they're spending their money. <coughs> and on the right is an application idea called Metro Bar where it gives you um, ways to find drinks and places to go socialize with your friends and build sort of a point system. Um, but I wanted to sort of show you how just visually you can use this sort of canvas space to to connect all these scenes and make it more immersive. Um, live tiles. So I want to spend a couple slides here because I think that these are so important for the retention element of applications. And if you do a good job with your live tiles, you can really embrace um, and keep the users using your app over and over. Not a lot of applications right now in the marketplace do a great job of this. There's um, a traffic app out there for in the Seattle area that has a really beautiful live tile story. It actually shows you on the tile the um, live traffic data coming in. So you, it entices you each time you use it to one, keep a pin on start. So it's one of those core things, but also that you know you can get a more immersive traffic information if you need it when you're traveling. Um, so think about how to use playful innovation with your theme and your brands and to embrace that notification story. If you want technical details on how to do this, Thomas Fennell is actually going to go into a lot of detail in his talk on Thursday. So I encourage you to attend that because he'll really help answer a lot of those questions around the push notification system. So here's sort of the, if you follow the metro to the letter of, OK, here's the, the templates that they give us um, to use. You can bake some pretty basic template ideas that fall in line with a lot of the first party experiences. But you don't necessarily get that strong sense of the brand popping through in these if you just follow it to the letter. So how do you in innovate on this? First of all, embrace the fact that we give you the accent color. You can use transparency in the PNGs as an accent to your own brand idea and your own brand iconography. So for example, in the Metro Bar concept that we came up with, what we've done here is actually made the center part of the, the drinking glass a transparent element. So now every time the user changes their system theme, their tile will update and feel fresh and live in addition to also still telling that brand of the Metro Bar brand. So the two things don't have to negate each other. Branding and theming can work together in a really nice way. Notifications. Um, I think that something that hangs a lot of people up is this idea that notifications need to represent data that's always up to date, that right this very moment I'm getting four emails in my inbox and I need to know about it. 
It's harder to do that in our notification system that we've given to developers. We're continuing to work and build on ways to make it more dynamic and up to date, but it doesn't limit you from doing really enticing things to get the user to come back into your application. So think about projecting information of, of what's coming in the future. In the example of this Metro Bar case, we've chosen a variety of images that the server can push up that tell you about upcoming drink specials. Or you know, if you had a music application around concerts, it might entice you to come and see a concert that's happening the next day. Or if you have um, you know, a radio broadcast that you want to project you know, what's on the agenda for the next morning, all of these things can be served up you know, several hours or even a day in advance through the notification system and still feel fresh and entice that user to jump back into the app and see what's going on. So on the motion side, um, just to walk through a few of the basics that exist in the platform, um, Turnstyle is an animation that's available today through uh, the toolkit. And its intention is to be used to connect large spaces, so jumping from one application to another application. Or, and, um, so this is an example here where you know, it just sort of feathers in nicely and each element feels sort of unique and fresh in this two and a half D space, but it helps the user know they're leaving one conceptual space and moving to another one. The continuum animation is a motion that's designed to help um, give a lighter sense of space within an application, so you can use it to connect page elements from um, one scene to the next. And this is really useful when you think about that information hierarchy and how you're going to connect all your scenes together. You can utilize the continuum to help tie those pages um, and have sort of a common theme so users feel grounded and know where they are and what they're looking at. Um, oops. Oh, no. Let's go back going to play. Sorry, I clicked too many times. Let's do this one more time. There we go. So the swivel animation, we like to um, isolate this to really specific cases where you need to have a partial screen or a transient UI element kind of come and overlay on top of the page. And the important thing with the swivel animation is making sure the user understands it's not a navigation away from where they are so that they don't feel like any work that they did on that page is lost and they don't feel like they've left um, the area. And so that's that swivel animation. Um, it doesn't kill their task at hand. And then the slide is the last one. And this one is used mainly to help kind of indicate sort of the more dead-end scenarios in your application where um, you kind of travel through. We use it a lot in our setting spaces where um, you want to basically pull up a page that generally doesn't connect to some other experience. It's just sort of informational or you know, accomplish a task and get out of it again. Um, so for innovation on motion, Think about the details when you think about how you want to innovate on motion and understand um, ways to do it that, doesn't, that has a purpose and an intention to it. So don't use motion strictly to make an application feel flashy because I think users see through that really quickly. It, it looks um, sort of superficial in that way. But you can use motion in a really um, beautiful ways to help in, hint at interactive elements on the page. Um, think about when you're trans, trans um, when you're moving into a new page, if you have an element there that's maybe having some discoverability issues, you could think about how the animation on that page might help the user understand what it is they're supposed to do or click on. You should use motion to help create a sense of space and layer lots of um, elements into that space. And, and most importantly, and what we're trying to illustrate in this motion here is that you can use motion to help bring your brand story to life. So you know, once you've got sort of the, the metro layouts and you start applying your brand, the motion is a really delightful way that you can add um, brand into an application without um, impeding on the utility of the pages. Um, but at the end of the day, the con this is my motion designer wanted me to, to iterate this. The content is still your focus. It's not how you get there. It's not the flashiness of the motion. It's really around what they're doing and why they're on that screen. And the motion should just be there to help that. All right, so I'll see what am I doing on time. I have no idea. I'm just going to keep talking. <laughs> Hopefully I won't run over. Um, so this next section, I want to just sort of put this to the test a little bit. So one of the designer who's been working on this presentation with me is an avid golf fan, and he was thinking about what type of um, application he would want to build if he were able to build a golf app from scratch. So we'll talk through kind of constructing that user journey and how he came about um, building the page structures and the visuals for that application, and then thinking about ways that you could differentiate it and make it really come to life. So first 
going back to this concept of design process, I talked about establishing a common set of goals and principles, and I can't stress enough how important this is. You can actually you know, find, if you have these written down and you share them with the team, you can use them down the road to help alleviate conflict um, within the team. If you have a tough conversation around a choice you need to make, you can cross-check them against your principles and against your goals, and it can often help um, move the conversation forward in a really productive manner. So for the golf app in particular, um, you know, we decided on focusing on a, that shared experience of golf, but not, um, not forcing them to be out of the moment. So you know, when you're on, it's intended to be used on the field, and you're going to be in the game playing with all of your friends, and you don't want to be stuck in this app trying to enter all these statistics because you want to be enjoying the fresh air and enjoying the fun game of golf. So focusing on that shared experience and letting that social element still flourish. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the application captured and saved relevant statistics and details about the game and that it should be easy to do when you're distracted. So those are the goals we wrote down. And then we entered into that, con that sort of concept phase where you start brainstorming ideas and thinking really big and looking at other types of applications out in the space. And this is a fun part of the project where you can pull in team members and stakeholders and get everybody involved and it gives you a really um, great platform in which to get fresh ideas flowing and think about this as a team together and write them out. You can you know, think about activities that maybe use post-it notes on the board or perhaps you just shout them out in a free-form manner. Maybe um, you know, however you want to structure it in a way that works for your team. But think big and throw out all of the crazy ideas in your head. There's no wrong answer in this point in the design process. It's just get it out there, talk about it, and see what sort of fun stuff evolves, no matter how ridiculous it might be. And then, um, after you've sort of spent time ruminating on all of the big stuff, you start to narrow down into one that everybody's excited about implementing. That the one idea that sort of shined from that brainstorming session is digging into the, to the, what the application's going to do from an information architecture point of view and understanding that hierarchy of the app. So in the case of the golf app here, you know, we knew we needed to enter into the app and immediately be able to start a new game and enter some statistics. So at the top level, you know, we really want to have entry points into those top you know, two or three tasks. And then at each page level below, have a more rich experience around you know, selecting courses and, do, and filling out the data in the game. And so sort of mapping that out at a hierarchy level before you worry about what's exactly on the page. And then start thinking through at a page level. This is where you, know, you start to get into the nitty details around the interaction and that flow that you're going to walk through when you're using an application. So the golf app, you know, you have to load the application, so there needs to be sort of a loading experience, and then what happens immediately after that? Presenting the user with the prioritized tasks for this particular app, you know, either finding a course to play on, starting a new round of golf, or maybe viewing some of my statistics, making sure those are present at that top level, and then thinking through for each of them, what are the set of screens that you need to build for them? Um, and how will you present it on the page. And this is where you can play around with ideas for how you structure your pivots. You can play around with the different layout concepts you might want to do um, and think about the level of fidelity of information you'll want to share on each of these screens. Um, when is it appropriate to put in imagery versus having just really flat lists? And the, mocking this up on paper gives you the ability to sort of think through lots of variety and lots of options. And you can you know, almost traverse the whole application um, on your tabletop and help you work out any kinks in the flow that you might not have noticed if you just started coding. Once the team has sort of settled on this rough visuals, so in this case you've got um, you know, our, our setting up the game is sort of on the left so, and all the screens that you would need to start a new round, and then on the right if you wanted to um, choose new courses to play at, um, what would those pages look like? Then you can start actually applying the Metro style to it and thinking about how your, bland, your brand will pull through. So um, you know, looking at the layouts, the margins, the white space, thinking about your typography and thinking about the use of color um, in a way that helps your story really come to life. So um, that's sort of that. So after um, you've nailed the basics, and that's sort of what I would call all of these things, is nailing the basics. Like we had this goal um, with the application that you can play a game of golf without being distracted by your app itself. Um, then you can start, I would encourage you to start thinking about where you can add delight to the experience, but make sure you get those basics first. Because at the end of the day, the user cannot accomplish the basic task of playing a round of golf and entering the data, then you've you failed, and those principles you set up early on have not been met. 
So meet the principles first and then think about the delightful elements. There's a lot of ways you can add delight to applications. Panoramas are an easy and fun way to do it, but make sure you keep in mind that immersive, um, more exploratory experience with the panoramas. Don't make them about doing too much work at the top level. Give the user sort of fresh new ways to look at the content and the opportunity to drill down into deeper, more um, data-rich experiences underneath. So the uh, golf app in particular here, kind of thinking through more of the social and browsing experiences for golf kind of after you finish the game and you're back at home, you know, and you want to go over how everybody performed, serving up some fun infographics, showing all the statistics, maybe thinking about what is the user going to do with my app in the off season when it's really cold and snowy outside. I still want them to come and use the app again and again. So then you can, you know, think about those sort of layered on elements to help retain them for the long haul. And then, um, you know, you've got this great plan, this great idea for an application. You, the commit and the realize phase is so important here. So, that, you know, you validate it against your principles first to make sure you haven't gotten too far off track. The coding can get underway and verify it on device. I know last year there were not a lot of devices out for developers to use because the phone hadn't come out in the retail stores, but thankfully now there's phones everywhere and you should be able to verify them on device. The emulators are not particularly great and they will often represent things in a way that looks or feels totally differently than when you actually get it on a device itself. So please make sure you're doing that um, every time you're compiling new rounds of code. And then going back to that bug fixing and the visual uh, polish that I talked about earlier is making sure that you prioritize that visual fidelity as equal to its peer in the functional side and doing the two things together um, up until the bitter end. And then what's next? So I'm almost done. Um, you know, just try to internalize this this idea of design thinking and the design process. And understand that Metro is not just about making apps that look cool, that it's actually sort of an inherent thinking process on, on prioritization and understanding user journeys and user flows and what that means for your experiences. You can start applying this to your current apps and also to new features that we'll be talking about this week. And there's a lot of talks going on this week with um, app, the app team um, from the Windows Phone team who will be going into more sort of detailed implementation stuff that I'm certainly not going to talk about here. So I mentioned um, Thomas's talk about the push notifications and live tiles on Thursday. Stefan Wick is doing a talk this afternoon um, really around some expert lessons for building good applications. And then Jeff Wilcox is also doing a talk that's specifically around performance and how you can have a really sort of performant and exciting application in that sense. So that's all. Thank you so much. Do we have time for questions? I have no idea what time it is. No? What's that? Four minutes. Is there any questions in the last four minutes? Yes? Designing for mobile first and then going to the desktop. Um, I don't necessarily think that either one is better or worse than the other. I think that the, I would just try to keep in mind how the experiences connect and have commonality, but also offer up uniqueness so that they're not exact mirrors of one another. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Sorry. We can talk more afterwards. Right. The question was whether there were any tools coming out that apply this methodology to help designers to meet this vision, and um, not immediately that we're working on improving documentation. There are resources already out there, but I know they're not perfect yet, so um, if you have ideas about the types of things that you want to see, let us know, because there's a lot of people invested in making this a priority in the future. Um, I think we were really trying to get some of the, the rote um, how to build apps out the door first, and then we'll focus on some of that stuff in the next round. Yes. Thank you. Um, I believe all, so the question was whether the talk's available as a PowerPoint, and I think all the presentations will be available as videos. I don't know if the actual slides will be available or not, but you can try to find a coordinator and ask them. Yes, hi. Sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. 
Right. Right. So the question was around how to build search experiences into third party applications. <laughs> um, I, I can't answer the why you can't use it question, but in terms of thinking about how to build search into your applications, again, make sure you think about when it's most appropriate for a, a user to need to search. So um, I think there's a fear that you need to have the search button always present on every single page. And I think that if you um, break it down to the most important scenes where they're going to be searching, or maybe that first run experience, if it's sort of available there for them, that can be helpful so that you don't clutter the UI with search buttons everywhere. Um, you can also think about using the application bar and having that be a common element in, the, in most of your screens where search is really important, just putting it in the application bar if it's not a panorama. But uh, I don't know. There's not a super easy answer on the search one because every application is so unique. Yeah. Yeah, I would say try wherever possible to put it in the application bar. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Yes. I'm not sure if I understand. Sorry. Can you say that again? Right. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know if I can project about what will be the future. I know that. Building applications on the Windows Phone platform, you'll get a much more rich and immersive experience because it'll, you know, you'll be able to, I don't know how to answer this question very well. Um, there are a lot of commonalities between the two. I mean, in some ways, applications are just a recreation of the web. Um, I think that, it, you know, the technology you use to build them at the end of the day shouldn't matter if the vision and the journey that you're trying to build is really clean and crisp, then you know you can build it in a variety of manners. Um, it's, you know, there isn't anything unique about a web page that makes it any more special than an application if the story is really strong and, and the journey is really strong. Exactly. So he said that users don't care about technology, they only care about the experience, and that is so true. The technology to a lot of users is just totally agnostic, and they, as long as it works, and it just is there, and it works correctly, and it's magical, then that's what, you know, they get excited about. Yes. Hi. You. I can't see. These lights are bright. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Are you talking about specifically on the Windows Phone? Yeah, there's some, the Tab Center in the Windows Phone browser should let you go back to the other pages. Why don't we, I'd have to see exactly which flow you're trying to do. It's hard to visualize. Maybe we can talk afterwards and you can show me on a phone. Okay. Yes. The firm of. I don't think I can speak to that in here. I'm not I'm talking about implementation as much around like which technology you choose. So sorry. There's um, other people on my team I can try to point you to who might be better suited to answer that question. Any other questions? All right. Cool. I'm gonna go. Thanks so much for coming.